So there's been a lot of talk about transformation, especially in institutions of high learning. Um, and today in particular, OPTV is joined um, by Eusebius Makaiza, a former um, Rhodes student who is now a Rhodes alumni um, and is now a, is a political commentator. I think he doesn't really need much of an introduction. Um, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. How was, how was your talk? I know you're attending a talk. Yeah, I was actually, talk. I'm in Grapes at the moment for the SciFest Africa Festival. Mm -hmm. And it was fantastic. It was nice not to talk politics for one hour. <laughs> so you were talking about science, right? And how It was about science, mm -hmm. but basically the question I was asking is, can science tell us anything about morality? And for me, the answer is not much. Not much. Not much. And so, what's the little that it can tell us? Well, it tells us why people behave in certain kind of ways. So if you have a gene for obesity, okay. it tells you that if you eat like a crap load of KFC, you're going to get okay. fat more quickly than, okay. than welcome who doesn't <laughs> have the same gene. But what okay, it doesn't tell enough. you, it, it doesn't tell you that. whether you must eat the KFC. So a gene, okay. a gene tells me what your predisposition okay. is, but it doesn't determine your behavior. So it was fascinating. We got sidetracked along the way about whether whether a gay gene gives you a reason to, to act. <laughs> that was great fun. That's but of course, the, the really exciting stuff on campus at the moment is the yes, politics. Yes, yes. And this is what I want to get to. You're a former Rhodes um, student. Um, and I think you've been here for a few days. You've spoken mm -hmm. to a few students about what's been going on. Um, what, what are you making of this moment and everything that's going on? I think it on? is bloody exciting. I always thought Rhodes University campus is very apathetic. Mm -hmm. That as alum, we romanticize what it was like being here, mm -hmm. that it is an inclusive space, that it is transformed, mm -hmm. that it is safe. You can send your kids here, they'll be barefoot, bisexual moment, drama student, weird hair, and they'll just be really, really cool. But in reality, it's not like that. And we'll get into the details, but what's exciting just up front about the discussion, should there be a name change, mm -hmm. what are the transformational issues, is that it's, it's just really awesome to see Rhodes students actually take an interest in political questions about educational spaces instead of getting drunk every day. <laughs> this is true. There was a talk recently um, with students who had gathered um, with the VC to talk about you know, the issue. Um, and one thing the vice chancellor said was, um, from out of here, that the name, the question of the name change is out of question. I mean, it's off the table. Um, what's your view on the question of the name change? Do you think the name should be changed? I think the VC is just wrong. I think he's new in office, and so he's trying to play Desmond Tutu. Mm -hmm. you, you can't say to students, listen, I, I kind of get where you're coming from. I might even give you a bear hug. <laughs> I think he got emotional in some way. I love him to bits. I really do. He's an amazing human being. But there are downsides to being a nice person. Mm -hmm. It is not understanding the importance of disruption. Sometimes if you want to deal with hegemony, whether it be the hegemony of white people, mm -hmm. heterosexuals, wealthy people, people in the north in global politics as opposed to the south, you've got to use different tools. Sometimes you've got to be Desmond Tutu. Sometimes you've got to be Malcolm X. This is a Malcolm X moment okay. for students. So, okay, for students, um, I think we'll get to students, but a lot of people are obviously wondering um, with the VC um, and this position that he's in and... A lot of people have also spoken about um, how the funders are responsible um, for this and how they will not budge into this conversation um, to have the name changed or have the statue removed at UCT. Mm. Um, what does this say about him being in this position? Well, I mean, position? you know, I, I, the VC has got to take the right position. Mm -hmm. He mustn't game. And the right position he has to say to students, I understand why the name rubbed you the wrong way around in the same way in which the symbolic value of an odious heritage in the form of the statue of Cecil John Rhodes at UCT, mm -hmm. I can see why it's deeply aesthetically and morally offensive for students who have to see that statue every day. Similarly, I see where you're coming from. What the VC did on Thursday, um, from reports of everyone that I've spoken to being mm -hmm. there, is basically to say the transformation issues are real. They've got to do with curricular content, with staff, whether this space is an inclusive space for you. It's not really about the name. Let's leave the name. If we can evolve the material things about the university, the name is a sideshow. That's, that's, that's absolute rubbish. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in a name. Yes. So there are two important things here, Welcome. The one is that the cost argument mm -hmm. is, is, for me, untested at best. This idea that if you're going to bring about a change in name, whether it's a street name, parliament, the university name, mm -hmm. that you will have inherently operational budgets suddenly being impossible to manage mm -hmm. for the next 50 years because you've got to put up new brochures. 
I'm not convinced by that, that you will have flight. If an old guy has been investing in roads for 50 years and he knows no other university that he has relations with, I'm not convinced that he's going to divest. So all the fears about the cost is a way to avoid the difficult emotional argument about symbolism and about heritage. The other trick that the VC played politically, but mm -hmm. I don't think students are buying it, not the ones that I spoke to on my way to the mm -hmm. Rank and Parrot, <laughs> is this idea that if we, if we speak about the name change, we're going to forget to speak about the fact that there's no black dean. No, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll do both. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, I think um, another thing to follow up on that, because I asked you earlier on if you think the name should be changed, and it sounds like... Uh, you, I think you personally, I'm indifferent. But if there was a referendum amongst alumni that say yes or no, I will say yes, change it. How are you indifferent when you're on a personal students? level? Yes, you you were a student here. I tell you why because I, the reason why I would vote yes in a referendum, but mm -hmm. secretly I'm indifferent, is because the yes is a solidarity yes vote with so many students for whom right now because they're in the system the challenges of an untransformed campus mm -hmm. really, really irks your daily experience as a South African in this space. And that's why it would be a symbolic vote. The reason why, personally, I don't secretly care so much for it is because my question really is the one that the VC wanted to make the conversation. Mm -hmm. But unlike him, I, I'm also interested in hearing students on the name. My, for me, the issue is what can we do to make sure that my niece who is here, who's got seven A's in matric, doesn't have to hustle for her third textbook because she's on a student loan, but the loan doesn't understand that you can be getting your loan for the academic fees and for res, but you still have to be a social creature who's comfortably in the space. What are we going to do about the fact that there's no black male in a, a lectureship position on this campus, South African black male? Uh, deans, when, which of the faculties are headed by, by black folk, for okay. example? Those issues are real. So for me, if... if if we got all of those issues right like this okay. and kept the name, I would settle for that. Okay, fair enough. Um, I think uh, to, to work on that as well, I think there's a tendency um, with a lot of people I've spoken to because I was um, back at UCT talking to a few people. And in doing that, I tried talking to some white people about this to say, what do you think about road students um, saying the name should be changed and the statue mm. being removed? Can I get your opinion on this? Um, and a lot of people have been saying, no, I can't say anything about this. Um, and I've, I, I think I even said to someone that I find that to be quite cowardly um, at a state in sure. which we are a society that's all supposed to get together um, for people to say um, I'm indifferent or but I think they had an interesting argument in saying it wasn't I want this is not my fight to fight I want you know I think you put your I, I really think that's that your response to them is profoundly important very important it cuts to so many debates we're having in the country at the moment. There mm. are raw debates about transformation and about social justice. Quite frankly, having a, I wash my hands, I don't have a view mm -hmm. on this. It's not my battle to fight. Mm -hmm. It is morally culpable. Yes. It is the equivalent of walking past a domestic dispute where a big burly man is beating up someone and just whistling and pretending you're not seeing it. It, there's no such thing as neutral silence and neutral indifference. And I think that, that discomfort that you were feeling, I think you've articulated it well. So, so if you have a student who's a road student who's watching this conversation, who's pretending they don't have a view, there's nothing cool about not having a view. It's actually irresponsible. So, so okay, I'm going to put the onus on you as well to, um, you know, have a view. Um, on the name. Um, on the name. I'm not just here, but in public as well. Um, because, and also I think you mentioned that you said on the committee of, you know, selecting... Selecting Rhodes Scholars for Rhodes Oxford, Scholars, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. What, what do you make of that? We'll get back into the other issue. But what what's, what's your So my view, uh, so I got the scholarship. I went to Oxford. Yes, a lot of As we now infamously mm -hmm. know, courtesy of the trolls, I obviously didn't finish my degree. So I'm really a cool example because not only do I hate Cecil John Rhodes, I also took his money and I didn't marry <laughs> him. <laughs> so like, that's really awesome. So, but here's a snag about it. Yes. How do I feel about that? No, I don't feel cowardly or hypocritical. Mm -hmm. You've had a couple of, especially white trolls on Twitter going, if you really, if you really hate the guy's money, yeah. why did you take the scholarship? Well, I'll tell you why. The reason I took his money is because the money's not his. Um, if you are a politics, it's not Cecil John Rose's money. Not okay. morally, it's legally his. But if you've read, for example, Robert Nozick, there's such a thing called, in political theory, and it's a very coherent concept, mm -hmm. unjust acquisition of wealth. If wealth has been acquired oh, in an okay. unjust I manner, see, see the wealth, the wealth <laughs> may belong to that person in terms of the law, okay. but there's a moral sense in which the money is not his. So as far as it's I'm concerned, the best way from. to show the middle finger to the theft okay, is to recognize that the money is in law 
belonging to the legacy of Cecil John Rhodes. That's but for good. me, yeah. I am actually, I went to Oxford. I learned a lot. I, I sharpened my philosophical skill on John Broom. I went to London. I was clubbing. I was being cosmopolitan. <laughs> and learning all these things. I, I used theft, money that was stolen, hmm. in order to increase my ability to come back and to confer and further to chip away at um, his so legacy. So, There's no contradiction. So is that is that is that is that you saying that sort of makes it better? Yes, that but but it's, it. it's 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 a two pronged argument. Instrumentally, you can take the money of a of someone who's been a colonial bastard and do good things with it. That's one part. Mm -hmm. of it. But the 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 I, I hope slightly more subtle second point is besides the instrumental value, there, there's a principal point here. Morally, I don't recognize this wealth as belonging to him. Oh, okay, it no, belongs to him. Okay, yeah. okay. So when you, you say, when you, say it, you, see okay. you were a rose scholar, you took the money, you're being a hypocrite. That's then good. I, was, then I, want, I want to say to that person, you don't get what I'm saying. There's a sense in which I went to Oxford, not, not on Cecil John Rhodes' money. I went to money that was generated as a result of the oh. incredible human rights abuses of black people in this country. Mm. It is their money that I was drinking in Oxford, not Cecil John Rhodes' money. Hmm. Okay, so um, I was just telling you earlier on that on my way here um, from, from Cape Town, um, I Did you have was... a compass? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, but um, I was just trying to think through some of the questions I would ask you. Um, and in doing that, I was in, in the... In the you know, bus we were driving back down with, um, and a friend of mine just took out, you know, your book, um, Could I Vote DA? Um, I think people can find it where... Well, I've not right? tweeted the answer after my tour with Zilla. The answer is actually that I can't vote DA, but please <laughs> do buy I the book I anyway. think it's very clear from <laughs> anyone who's read the book that not you can't vote DA. Not currently. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, but my point is, um, reading this book, I think... One thing you bring about as a voter's dilemma is something that a student um, at this moment we are almost pretty much caught up in that dilemma um, somehow in a sense that um, there's, there, there's two structures or two, you know, how do I say this, two modes. Um, you have the university versus students and they just can't seem to agree, um, right? Um, okay. And the dilemma is um, how does one recognize the other? Um, mm. And I think this comes down to, you know, the liberalism that you speak of in saying we need to listen to each other mm. um, and open. But can we, can we, why don't we complicate that a little bit because I think that's too, okay. that's too, kum, not too kumbaya. I think that I got to of student Wait. at university is not accurate <laughs> because the <laughs> black academics, female academics, um, academics from working class backgrounds don't feel like they own the institution. So I don't think mm -hmm. there's a student versus uh, university distinction. Okay, let here, me say this. Let right? me make this clear. Uh, because this is the example that you made with the Ubuntu example. Um, that for some, for someone, that's someone's view. Mm. Um, some some people are saying. Um, I think what's his name, Fan Olsen, talks about how, you know, Ubuntu is belongs to them, to the African liberalism, yeah. Um, right? Yeah. Um, and so that distinction, and okay. having spoken to UCT students um, who are saying, you know, we want to have African names, um, and this is the next question in terms of if we do change the name, what name are we going to have? Um, you know, that, that's the dilemma. Is oh, it, I see is what not, you mean. Is it not? I don't think that's the most important dilemma. I was asked a similar question by David Smith from The Guardian in relation to the statue. He asked me, what should happen to the statue? Should it go to a museum? Where, where, where do we go mm -hmm. from here? I don't avoid questions because I'm comfortable to give a viewpoint and make a case for it. Mm -hmm. But I really think this is, this, is a, this is a legit example of where one can critique the question as missing the point of the overall struggle in the sense that, mm -hmm. to be honest, I don't give a rat's behind whether we put that statue in a museum, in the VC's attic, on a dump, Mm -hmm. crush it or cover it with paper and then put it somewhere weird in, a, in the Kirsten Bosch Gardens. I don't care what happens with it. Mm -hmm. The journey of the statue after it has been removed is not important. It is the recognition that the statue represents a morally odious past that continues into the present in a way in which curricula is not um, dealt with, et cetera, et cetera, and all the, the real transformational issues we're going to get to. Okay. No, no, but, but let me, let me okay, finish the thought. Okay. So the, 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 the point being that if one, if one obsesses about 
Will you call it Makana University, University of Grahamstown, University of the Eastern Cape, Nelson Mandela's second university, not the metropolitan one? That's, that I don't really care for. And even if that's a difficult process and we come up with four names, complicated council process and alumni vote, I don't care for that. The victory is in recognition. Recognition that the name deeply offends for good reasons and must go. The process for what we do for to arrive at a name that is mutually acceptable mm -hmm. in the way in which you're talking about those values that are, that, that, that are clash yes. or re-emerge in searching for a new name. Mm. That's okay. I agree. I, I, surely you will agree with me, Malcolm, that if we get to a point where we are searching for a new name, we've made huge strides. Yes. yes. So I don't care how that yes. plays out. Yes. If we're already there, we, we really make yes, it, it is. I agree that it is an opportunity for the university to get together and, you know, try find um, a name that everyone can agree with, identify with. Um, but a lot of people have diverged the issue of the name change to the real issues that are going on, the actual institutional transformation um, that needs to happen within institutions. Um, and before we can get into that, um, I, I want to ask you, as a former Rhodes student, what your experience was back um, in the back whenever um, you were here. I'm not sure about the years. You can tell us and give us a suggestion. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a secret. <laughs> I was here from 1997 until 2003, um, and I come back and forth because I'm also, which I think is the other reason why I may be different to many alum that you speak to. I'm also from Grahamstown, mm -hmm. and I'm from yes. Grahamstown that a part of Grahamstown that is excluded by the way in which this university conceives of itself. So mm -hmm. I also have deep issues with the university not, not caring about inequity in Grahamstown. So I really care for, for what happens to the changes, transformation. Mm -hmm. but I'm embarrassed because where my politics is at now is very different to our experience roads when I was here. Really? I experience roads hmm. through, through the eyes of, of someone who, who were thoroughly immersed in whiteness. And I blame, I don't know if I should blame what Graham do you College. Mean, what do you mean by having gone to Graham College? I have positive memory of, of roads. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't drink my first year. I snogged my first boy because while you're Catholic. Here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, it's just f incredibly fun memories. My journey in philosophy as a philosophy student was amazing. Uh, debating, my debating friends. My entire memory of, of, of roads at the point at which I left was I'm leaving behind six and a half of the best years of my life intellectually and socially. That's why I'm embarrassed. So you did not, um, but no, but you I, did not experience any... No, I did. No, but this is the thing. Institutional I think, racism I think, that everyone is speaking of. I think institutional racism can affect you without you feeling anxious or knowing that you're being affected. Okay. Uh, let me give a really horrible, controversial... So can I actually, on that, um, just to... Uh, before you respond, I'd like you to respond to this um, with... It's a, it's a depoliticized space, Rhodes, that is. Um, I'm not sure if this was the case back in your year, but like students are not, for example, allowed to speak up um, of yeah. run for SRC um, as a political party. I mean, I find that to be a very weird way of, you know, silencing um, no, students that's, as well. So that's, that is that's definitely... No, my, when I was here, Rhodes mm -hmm. wasn't quite like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had political... Wings of political parties were very active on campus. I guess I'm... I'm taking a long time to make a, a relatively simple point, that you can be comfortable, but only because you've learned how to mimic hegemony. That's okay. what I mean by I'm embarrassed, because okay. it doesn't okay. mean that there wasn't institutional racism, that it was a safe space, that it was a, a space that recognized what it means for a black boy from the township to be here amongst middle-class white people. Mm -hmm. So my, my comfort was mm -hmm. unreflective comfort. It's mm -hmm. not because Rhodes is now a, not a safe space or not a not an inclusive space. Roads is what it is and it has been what it's been for decades. So the roads that, that, that this protest is now playing out at in this mm -hmm. conversation is the same roads that I attended. The reason I didn't see the things that so many road students see now more clearly than I did and, and the way that I should have is just because there are different ways that you survive hegemony. You either become Malcolm X or you become assimilated. Mm. And I think many of us, myself included, enjoyed roads, but through assimilation politics. And it's only now as an adult, now that I'm 35, that I observe roads as a commentator. When I come back, I speak okay, to students. I and now I realize, I'm like, geez, dude, 
How did you survive this place <laughs> with your adult politics? Okay. But you weren't a lazy student. Okay. I did well. I did philosophy, law. I was in debating. I did current affairs. But there's, there's something about doing politics intellectually and then there's something about living politics. Mm -hmm. And I think the students who are upset and are involved in these conversations now, they're doing better than many of my peers did because they are mm -hmm. personally invested. We weren't. So it was always as horrid, the things that are horrid were always here. Mm -hmm. um, I avoided them by learning how to mimic whiteness. Mm -hmm. And you, in the book, one thing you also talk about um, is fear. Um, how a lot of in the book, you talk about the DA, white people are scared mm. of fear, of change, rather. Um, they fear change, and um, yeah. that's a difficult thing to deal with. And I like that you said um, this is why many companies, you know, have even established change um, development to help um, with that. Um, and obviously, I don't think this is something we need. I think you said it very well earlier on that we can get together and talk about this. But how how, how does... How should white people respond mm, to this? That's a, that's a beautiful question. White fear. White fear, I, you know, it's, it's, I'm finding myself as a commentator and writer, literally as we speak, literally the last couple of weeks, undergoing, I suspect, profound ideological changes. If anyone read my first book of essays and thought, this guy loves racialism, he's defending race-based categories even though they're social constructions, mm -hmm. I think my next collection of race essays are really going to make people think, oh my goodness, is this guy in bed with Andalem Kodama? <laughs> <laughs> because my politics are changing as we speak. Well, are you? That's, a, that's a long preface, welcome to say that, that one response to white fear is deal with it. Why must two black guys look into a camera and tell white people how to deal with it? Right? <laughs> right. So that's what I mean. That's yeah, right. like, we shouldn't be having no. that conversation. We must talk it's about not... what are we going to do to get other black kids okay. to be as, as eloquent and articulate as you, as a trained debater, to be a third party in this conversation. And we just like bloody awesome intellectually and politically. What are we going to do? We shouldn't be wasting time thinking like, how do we build alliances with white people? What do we do with a white kid who feels alienated, who feels threatened? It is white people who have to undergo their own journey. Just as my dad had to undergo a journey dealing with his homophobia that had nothing to do with me, yes. similarly, a white person, both the conservative, genuine, David Bullard racist mm. type, but also the, the, the ones that are equally problematic are the white allies who, who think like, don't generalize about white people. You don't want to alienate us. Actually, I'm not going to pat a white progressive student on the back for wanting to join a black students forum. It's not an achievement for which you must get credit for. You should be motivated by a sense of social justice rather than saying, now that I'm here, please make me as comfortable as possible. So part of me wants to say, I don't care for white discomfort. I don't want to have a Desmond Tutu conversation. If you want that conversation, speak to Jonathan Janssen or speak to the VC of Rhodes. As black people, I think we need to say to white people, you have a duty to go do your own work. Go read Samantha's paper. How do I live in this strange place? I think... Upon reflection, I was wrong, and Samantha was right. Maybe white people should be a bit more humble in how they approach this question of strategic cooperation. And so I don't know whether what I would have said to you last week I want to say now, because last week I took the tactical question, what do we say to white people more seriously than I do today? Now I think white people must just deal. Okay, so just to push that a bit further, um, they must just deal um, when, you know, or people... Deal. People are actually people. Nothing changed materially um, with regards to the shift um, in apartheid. Um, so is this just a matter of we just have to? They just have to deal um, emotionally with what's going on, and nothing should be done. That's part of the threat that a lot of white progressive, self-identifying allies of black people often say as well that if you are too aggressive, you don't hear us out, you make us uncomfortable, you lose us, we're a nice bridge between yourselves and um, Steve Hofmeyer. You need us to build a country in which people restore relations. I don't know when we ever had good ones, but restore relations in which we see each other as fully human. I don't, firstly, don't threaten me. I, I don't need, in order to self-actualize, to be a really good writer, to be an excellent journalist, to, to tell stories, to be a good novelist, to make good dockies, to, have a, to leave a footprint in the world, across the continent, in your field, as a black person. That doesn't require you to, to make the white student who is progressive or self-identifying as progressive comfortable. So there's firstly a profound white arrogance in the suggestion that materially, your material question, that we will struggle to make headway 
in learning how to find the best in ourselves as black people unless white people and ourselves are holding hands together. I reject that with contempt. I can form a reading group on this campus for a whole term where we read the most amazing ancient Greek uh, philosophy or where we decide we want to read a South African novel every week and we can get on with it. I'm not saying put yourself in a lager, don't care about relations. What I'm saying is philosophically and politically, the very idea that black liberation and self-actualization and being the best you can be inherently requires building strategic alliances with, 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 with whites who get it or helping whites to get it. I think that's deeply flawed. I think that's the last bastion of self-hate. Mm. And obviously materially that's, like I get, I get that, I get that, like in terms of self-actualization and I think that's good and we need to, you know, focus on that in as much as we need to take into account the material I'm continuing, and obviously that's a difficult question. Um, but um, another thing, I, sh I wanted to, I wanted you to read some this section. This is great, um, by the way. Yes, I lo I love yeah. the book, by the way. No, um, I mean your your, your, in your interaction. Yeah, you, it's, it's fantastic questions. I'm 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 really loving these challenges because it is a dialogue. It's not about someone. Yeah, it's not about them. someone. It's being not about right. someone downloading lessons. It's a really difficult conversation. For yeah. Us, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I just wanted you to read this. This section of the book. I have no idea what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope and, I don't repudiate and, the, what and I then said. we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> the most basic ingredient of a liberal society, in my view, is a society in which individuals are deeply respected as capable of deciding for themselves what values they want to adopt as the basis upon which to live. In practice, this might mean, for example, that I am an agnostic, selfish bastard who reads a lot of literature places as much, if not greater, value on friendships than on biological family relations, and little or no value on church, religion, the state, community, or wider society beyond paying taxes, complying with the law, and following what I regard as genuine moral requirements, like empathizing with those worse off than me. Yes. I think I was subtweeting myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think that's beautiful in that we need to... There needs to be a conversation about how, you know, black people who really, most of them haven't been given a chance, in fact, all of them haven't really been given a chance on a, uh, to get a platform upon which to speak or have a voice. Yes. Like the academics on campus um, who wrote a book talking about being at home. And mm. there are a lot of stories, that. there are a lot of stories about how people are uncomfortable mm. in universities, um, how they're not given a voice with regards to you know, merely being scholars, someone wrote an article saying we have, black people are just seen as mere tokens um, in universities and not as scholars. Um, so I do think there's some, you know, everyone needs to take into account that there's a moral, you know, we all have a moral obligation to each other somehow. We absolutely do. And this is where... To, to earlier, change those perceptions. But this is, this is, what, this is the, the earlier point, observation you made about siloing the debate around the name from the other transformational questions. And in order to create an environment in which that paragraph that we've read out about the individual being autonomous and being in a position to live the kind of life that you choose to based on your values, to maximize a space in which as many individual students and in society mm -hmm. citizens can live like that, mm -hmm. we do need to deal with, of course, the big issues that we haven't yet discussed in terms of what are the obstacles to a more inclusive and a more transformed campus look like? And those issues are very real. But I, I reject the idea that debating the statue or the name is incompatible with yes. focusing on those things. Yes, but equally, maybe there should, as, I think there's so much we can talk about, but speaking of so much, there's just so much coming up. The name, um, how, you know, the culture needs to change. Like, this is just... You know, it's, I was at UCT listening to the students talking, and I was like, this is great. Like, the ideas that are coming up are great, and they really should be taken seriously. Like, there's no reason why they shouldn't. But there are a lot as well. So to play devil's advocate there, in terms of, you know, being uh, real about what can be done, you know, what do we make of that? What should happen? What, what would be, what are low-hanging fruit to pick? Yes. Is that what you mean? Yes. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit to pick. For starters, if you are at Rhodes University, it is appalling that the Rhodes Philosophy Department should be struggling to have black staff. It is bizarre to me that we can't 
attract and retain black talent at the level of deans that look like the country that we live in? Where are black men teaching in this place? If we live in a country where we pathologize black men routinely, mm -hmm. we want to begin to humanize black men as well and not just problematize the black male body. Where are the black men to come and interact here with whiteness in the space beyond the VC, which can often give you the illusion of greater demographic change? I don't think those are difficult things. I think, I think if you said, let's, let's keep it as practical as possible. Mm -hmm. If you said to, to the VC, you're only going to get your contract renewed next year if you can find three black professors. I think we've got to do that. This is what Kalele Manglu at UCT mm -hmm. is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to come up against all sorts of interesting things that we then have to deal with, such as the perception that you're asking someone to lower standards, which yes. I, I, is absolutely not yeah, nonsense. Yeah, so that's a really low-hanging fruit. Yeah. So there's an even lower-hanging fruit before we talk about, about getting black staff or more women. Curriculum. I mean, it's, it's weird to me that until, until, quite frankly, a few years ago, you could be a politics science graduate at Rhodes University and even get a first and third year and not know anything about real politics in terms of tripartite alliance politics, mm -hmm. who the key members of cabinet <laughs> are. You, you can basically yes. fail a general knowledge quiz about South African politics in terms mm -hmm. of daily politics. You wouldn't understand social movements until Richard Pithouse arrived oh, here yes. and actually made social movements an important um, source of power. Right? Yes, and he's, yes. he's amazing. Yes. So that to me is a question of curricula. Now, I pushed Samantha Weiss the other night in, at UJ at the launch of this book, Being, Being at Home, which is a wonderful book oh, yes. on this topic. Oh, my gosh, yes. And I said to her, you know, don't you think that individual lecturers can also right now pick low-hanging fruit and think about what they teach, who they cheat, cheat, teach, so that their disciplines can speak to all the students' intellectual interests and personal biographies as far as possible mm -hmm. that come into their, into their lecture room. And mm -hmm. her response surprised me because I know Sam very well, and Sam thinks very hard about what, it's, what it means to be, to be white in South Africa right now. Mm -hmm. So I take her seriously as a philosopher. Mm -hmm. But she said to me and the audience, I teach what I've been taught. A good scholar can't teach things they don't know, which is fair enough. And if I've been taught, say, um, animal ethics, and I specialized in epistemology, then I will be inclined to teach that. That is lazy, Samantha. <laughs> Contrast her with a North American mm. philosopher called Professor Thaddeus Metz. Mm. He is the specialist on Ubuntu. Mm. He didn't come to so Africa no as an excuse. Ubuntu. What he did was he came here and he said, I'm an alien in this country, but I've got transferable skill sets as a philosopher. Mm. Where can I apply them? Oh, here's an, here's an interesting conversation. There's a thing called Ubuntu. I've never heard of that in moral philosophy in North America. But here seems to be an attempt to come up with a moral theory that's uniquely South African or African or of the region, at least sub-Saharan Africa. But it doesn't seem to be a very rigorous thing, like the rigorous concepts we have in Western philosophy. Why don't I see whether I can actually work in this field? Didn't know anything about Ubuntu, but he does know something about analytic philosophy. And then he applied himself to a new problem, a problem that is relevant to the context in which he teaches and lives. Mm -hmm. Why must I go to you, Jay, to be supervised by a North American orig originating mm -hmm. professor on a South African question like Ubuntu? But there aren't a Why? lot of South African It's laziness on the part of the professors. Yeah, that's, this is true. But I'm saying there aren't a lot of professors as well that, you know, just to... Like in South Africa, South African, especially black professors that could be hired. No, but that's what I'm saying. So it's not even a race thing. If we oh, accept yeah, your okay, earlier point, enough. if you okay, accept your earlier that. point where you that. said we all have moral duties to create a space in that. which we can all flourish, I get that. then even if someone is a white senior lecturer, mm -hmm. they need to ask themselves, if I've been working for the last 50 years on the metaphysics of color, is it going to hurt me for the next two years to work <laughs> okay. on social movements? Okay. No, it won't. So actually feel a sense of duty to make your curricula and your teaching methods as interesting and applicable to the context in which you teach. I think it's a moral failing and an educational failing yes. on the part of a teacher or a lecturer to not think about how their skill set will be most relevant to the students who come into the university space. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, and thank you so much for, for this conversation. Thank you for pushing me in dialogue. <laughs> yes, yeah, this was all rushed up, but thank you so much for coming through. Cheers.